Hello, tonight I am very fortunate to be in the company of not one, but four of the best-selling strain wave mounts on the market. That's right, I am stood alongside the AM5 mount, which is without a doubt the best-selling strain wave mount in history, the Jouet 14 mount, available for just over £600, and the Jouet 17 mount, which is available for just over £800. Now in recent years, these are arguably three of the most talked about mounts, but I'm willing to wager that you haven't yet heard of the fourth mount I'll be talking about today, which is very surprising, all things considered because out of these four mounts this is the oldest it is the em31 pro the og strain wave mount in today's video i'm going to compare the specifications and prices of each of these four mounts in order to determine which one is pound for pound the best mount available on the market today i'm damon scotting and this is astronomical so let's talk about the specifications of each of these mounts. I'm gonna start off with the AM5N because as it stands, this is the most popular strain wave mount on the market. And that's largely thanks to the fact that without a counterweight bar or any counterweights, it can support payloads of 15 kilograms, which is a tremendously large weight, especially considering the actual mount itself weighs less than six kg. All of them are incredibly travel friendly, but the idea that you can carry that much payload with something that weighs so little is an absolute game changer. But if you do have a payload that is slightly larger than 15, 15 kilograms, then you can add a counterweight bar and push the payload all the way up until 20 kilograms, which is really good. It also just so happens to be the exact same as the EM31 Pro. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, has this mount that I've never heard of just copied the AM5N? After all, this is an unbelievably popular mount. Well, it turns out that is the complete opposite of the truth, but it also has a ton of extra functionalities. The first one I'm gonna talk about is the fact that you can add additional accessories onto the sides of the mount, which allow you to increase your imaging capabilities. What I'm talking about specifically is that they have a listed accessory that is a ball head mount attachment, where you can put your camera on the base of this mount and image with effectively up to three different setups, maybe even more if you wanna push the limits a little bit further. So here's a full product list of what you can combine with the EM31 Pro mount. Now the AM5N mount basically has no additional accessories that you can attach on, but it's really exciting the possibilities that you have with this mount, especially the alt azimuth bracket mount attachment, which I know a lot of you aren't gonna to be too fussed about, but there are definitely some viewers out there that are gonna find this really exciting because it converts this strain wave mount setup into the perfect visual observing setup. Still with the exact same payload, you don't have to worry about a meridian flip. You don't have to worry about polar aligning. It just makes your user experience so much faster and easier. And then we move on to the, they look like they're small amounts, but they're not, they're basically the same size. Yeah, the Jouet 17, is practically the same size as these two mounts and the payload is very similar as well. Without a counterweight bar, it can carry 13 kilograms. With the help of a counterweight bar, 18 kilograms. So not quite the lofty heights of these two mounts, but still a very impressive amount. Yeah, I'm just gonna say something that might come across as being a bit rash, but these two mounts are practically knockoffs, but that's not the worst thing. Yeah, to tell you the truth, I actually really appreciate knockoffs. The Jouet 17 mount has the exact same payload capabilities as the earlier AM5 model. So the mount that came before this cost about $2,000, whereas this one costs $1,000. Now, of course, the main benefits that you're going to have are this comes from a well-established company with a very experienced customer help team available whenever you need them. If something goes wrong, you have the reputation of this huge company to fall back on. And given how many units they've sold, you can bet your bottom dollar that there are plenty of forums online in which users may have experienced the same issue that you've had and therefore you can come to a very quick solution. That's the biggest issue about this, is that because it's relatively unknown, underused, if something goes wrong, you're on your own and that can be scary to a lot of people. But if it's not, then this is a very good value mount. I like this a lot. I found no faults with it whatsoever. And even six months on after I purchased it for the first time, it is still holding out nicely. You okay? What are you doing? Good. Cat's starting beef with the neighbor's cat. Right, so now that we've spoken about the specifications, let's move on to the price points because these vary quite dramatically. I'm gonna start off with the most expensive of the bunch, and that is the AM5N mount. 
This is priced at $2,299 and is capable of the exact same payloads as the EM31 Pro. But the difference is the EM31 Pro only costs $2,129. Did I really just say only costs? The EM31 Pro is slightly cheaper than the AM5N, which is enough of a selling point, but that is not all that it's got going for it. It's got a lot of different features that the AM5N doesn't possess. So these are the upper Despite costing more than $2,000, these mounts are still considered to be relatively competitive prices in the astrophotography market, which is what makes these guys so unbelievably special. And unlike these mounts, they are not available from any official retailers. These mounts can only be purchased through websites such as AliExpress, which means they have to be imported from China, and therefore you can incur quite hefty taxes on top of the initial price. The Jouet 17 mount is priced at 1,000 US dollars. If you convert this into British pounds and you've got something that's about 609 pounds and 800-ish pounds. So incredibly cheap. And then lastly, we have the smaller variation of the Jouet 17 mount. This is the Jouet 14 mount. And the payload for this is a lot less than the others. Without a counterweight bar, eight kilograms. With the help of a counterweight bar, 13 kilograms. Now the Jouet 17 mount is very basic in the sense that it tracks the night sky, carries a big payload, ticks the boxes, that's it. It doesn't have any extra bells or whistles. It doesn't have an additional DC power port on the side of it, which allows you to power external devices. Right, so let's quickly go through the pros and cons of each mount then. Uh, I'm gonna start off with the cheapest one, and I know what you're thinking, if it's cheap, it must be crap. Well, I am happy to tell you that that's not the case. In fact, these have performed very well. I've used them intermittently over the last six, seven months or so. Obviously, the mounts that carry the heavier payloads are permanently mounted on these pier mounts just here. But yeah, there's been plenty of occasions throughout this year where I've brought these guys out and they've performed the job perfectly. I've had absolutely zero issues with them whatsoever. They've done exactly what I expected them to do. Um, the only con I can think potentially of the Jouet 14 is that the dovetail mount here is only suited for Vixen mounts, whereas all of the others have a much wider alternative in case you want to mount Losmandi on it instead. Very small con when it comes to this mount. Uh, moving on to the Jouet 14. I just wish there was an additional DC port so I could supply different elements of my setup because I don't like the idea of having to plug in two different 12 volt power supplies for when I've got my mount and then camera or ASI air mounted on top of it. In fact, the first time I actually used this mount, I decided to put the power supply into the Astro station that I had, which has now been renamed to Stella Vita, I believe, and then use one of its power outputs to connect a cable to power this mount and that worked absolutely fine and i think the reason for that is because that these mounts do not slew as fast as these mounts i'm pretty sure these are capped off at 2.4 degrees as their max slew speeds per second whereas these guys can handle up to six degrees per second and i assumed that as a result of these slower speeds that is the reason these were incredibly quiet compared to the am5 mount which is already in itself quite quiet but as i found out when using the em31 pro this is also very quiet. So I don't think it's because they're going slower that they're so quiet. I think it's just because they're tuned a little bit differently. The only real con I can think of when talking about the EM31 is that it's using the same interface as the usage away mount, which is on step. I'm trying to find the correct way to explain why this is a con. I think my main justification for it is that ZWO has a fully fleshed out system. It has a very useful app that you can connect to. The interface of it is incredible. And I find this to be very user friendly. The fact that this uses on step as well means that when you go on to the little remote control that you have here things feel relatively basic i don't know i just i'm not a fan of the remote control still being like this i wish we could step it up a page and maybe even integrate actual images of the objects that we're looking at you know like how when you go on to say the sea stars for example and you're going through the catalog of items that you can image tonight and it shows you previews or previous images that other users have taken of that object and it gives you an insight into what you're going to be looking at and what to expect. It makes astrophotography a much more exciting experience when you have a taste of what you're going to be imaging and this just feels like really fundamental. I don't know if that's a result of the fact that they're using on-step software, which don't get me wrong, it does the job. But yeah, I just feel like given that they are a company that is supposed to be rivaling ZWO in terms of their product experience, they could have provided something that's a little bit better than what they currently have. 
which then brings me on to the final mount and the con that I would go for the AM5N is simply that it is very expensive. Not that much more expensive than the AM31, but yeah, it's a bit of a weird one when it comes to this mount because the AM5 was my first introduction to strain wave mounts and it kind of set the benchmark for how much it should cost. I thought $2,000 makes sense for what it's capable of doing. And then of course I came across these guys and my estimations got blown out of the water. I suppose in the grand scheme of things, what all of these mounts are doing is a very simple process but i think it's simply that imaging the night sky is an incredibly fine art in order to avoid the stars trailing due to the rotation of our planet that the intricate work that they all do feels like it warrants the high price tag that they usually do right so in conclusion in terms of wrapping this video up i am going to decide on the best mount out of these four and give you and give you my recommendation on what it is that i think you should purchase if you have the budget to afford a $2,000 mount, then I would highly suggest that you go for the EM31 Pro purely because it has a longer list of functionalities. It is compatible with the ASI Air that is produced by ZWO, and overall I find it to be a lot more of a flexible mount. It can carry payloads up to 20kg, the same as the AM5, and it is of course slightly cheaper. But if you do decide to go ahead and buy the AM5N mount, you're not doing anything wrong. It is still an incredible mount. But if you are budget conscious, which I'm sure the vast majority of us are, then I would say without a doubt, get the Jouet 14 mount. I absolutely love its tiny size. It really does pack a punch. Yeah, the laser feature really shouldn't be contributing to my opinion as much as it is, but it just felt like a light bulb moment the second I used it. I was like, yeah, why don't all mounts have that? All four of these mounts are incredibly travel friendly, but none more so than this. It literally cannot get any better than this, right? I think more and more of us today are going down the refractor telescope route as opposed to getting the huge Newtonian telescopes. And it's because of that that I think the ability to handle payloads of up to 13 kilograms is enough. Don't get me wrong, 20 kgs is nice, 18 kilograms is very nice as well, but like, I'm happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as far as I'm concerned, if you ask me for my opinion, then I would say pound for pound, the best telescope mount that you can get is the Jouet 14 mount, which I'm very conscious might make some people upset, especially because these two companies got in contact with me and said, hey, can you review our mount? And I was like, absolutely, I'd be honored. Whereas these mounts I found on AliExpress from an unknown supplier and I decided to take a gamble on. And as far as I'm concerned, the gamble has paid off because, because I think they are great. Let me know what your opinions are on all of these mounts that I've showcased in today's video. I haven't actually got the chance to review the Skywatcher 100i or 150i, but that's largely in part due to the fact that I can't afford it and Skywatcher, I don't think, do partnership deals, or if they do, they don't do them with me. But yeah, let me know your personal opinions on each of these mounts in the comments down below. And if you're interested in buying one of them for yourselves, then I've attached links to each of them in the description down below. Thanks for watching. I'm Damon Scotting, and this was astronomical. Thank you.